So hello, everybody, and welcome to Cata School Cascadia's fourth anniversary Cata Geek Meetup. My name is Tracy Defoe, and I'm your host today. Uh, it was Sylvain's idea that we have most of the speakers from Cata School Cascadia regulars, and we treat it more like our party. Gemma's here, also from Cascadia, and we have um, Mark uh, Rosenthal, you'll see Mark, and Al Tung is here from Cata School Turkey, I guess, or Istanbul, do you say? And then William Harvey from somewhere in the United States. <laughs> uh, there are speakers, but I'm going to be our host, and I've been asked to start off with a brief presentation about uh, Cata School Cascadia and our origin story, how we got started. Oh, and then... And Tracy, can I just mention while you're sharing your screen yes. that we have a mural that we're going to use as almost always that we do these things. Um, so join the mural and you can add your comments and chats. There's various links on there as well. Um, and there'll be some resources you can download afterwards. And each of the speakers has a question. Each question will give us time for uh, you to either ask a live question. We'll probably only have time for one or two live questions each person. And but everybody can put comments or questions on the mural. And I've left some time at the end if you can stay past the hour for a little socializing, but also for more questions. So it will be fun is our promise. So let's get on with the fun. So let me tell you a little bit about Cata School Cascadia. Uh, most of the time we are a Zoom community. And here's a picture that I like to use that has over our whole history has pictures of Cata School Cascadia. I usually try to get the ones where we're smiling and Cascadia, if you are new to us, is the name of a geographic region that stretches from um, the West Coast, on the West Coast of the Pacific Ocean, all the way from uh, the top of British Columbia, where I live, down to the middle of California. So we have people from British Columbia, Washington, Oregon, as our founding people. But our origin story comes from a live event back in September 2019. Um, Cass Taylor, and you can see Tucker there at the bottom, hosted a stop on Tilo Schwartz's Cata Coaching Dojo World Tour. And we brought together about 40 uh, people uh, to experience the dojo for the first time. And um, you can see there a nice picture of Julie Simmons, who's also one of our founders. And here's a picture of the original facilitators from that um, Cata Coaching Dojo workshop. Uh, and you can see Mark, Hal, uh, me, of course, Julie, and Jennifer. I don't think Maria's in this picture, but those are the people who, um, after this workshop, uh, actually, after this workshop, I went away for a vacation. When I got back, I said, have people got together yet to practice? And the answer was no. And so I, I just sent out a Zoom, which was a brand new thing, and said, hey, Friday, this Friday at lunch, why don't you join me and we'll practice some of the stuff. We'll see how we're doing following that workshop. So um, there you go. I had a slide for that. Where do, we where do we bring our questions? Where do we find help? Where do we practice? How about we get together? And from that time, four years ago today, we have uh, first, for the first year or so, we were just a group of coaches who got together. And then um, January 2021, I think, we became a real CATA school. And we have worked really hard together um, to define our mission and to become a welcoming and open and um, both a teaching and a practice in CATA school. So a little bit about CATA school Cascadia, just in case you don't know us. We, as I just said, we started as a regional group, but now we welcome people from around the world. We have an online community and in person, and we really stress that learning is fun and everybody needs Cata friends. We do two 30-minute Zooms every Friday. Uh, one we call the Starter Cata Zoom. That's at noon Pacific. The other one is for coaches. I, I, my goal for those is always as if you walked into the lunchroom or perhaps the bar at Catacon and you saw Mark Rosenthal sitting there talking perhaps to Gemma, and you thought, wow, I'd love to talk Cata with those guys and you join the group. So that's the vibe I go for on the Zooms. They are unscripted, and it's like show up, hang out, meet Cata friends. Um, that's what we do. We have also had a number of Cata Geek meetups, which you know, because you're at one. But uh, you may not know that we have a YouTube channel, so look for us on YouTube. Uh, we have a resource mural board, uh, much like the, a little bit like the one that we're using for this meeting, and Gemma puts that together, so thank you, Gemma. And we have a mascot. And so... Um, we have the mascot is there at the end. You'll see 
them here and also the baby Yeti behind me. I don't know Yeti comes from a coach's discussion about the importance or the power of adding the word yet to I don't know. And we made that um, Yeti our mascot. We also have a website, uh, cataschoolcascadia.org, and just about everything you want to know about us and all the links to all the things will be on that website. Um, I wanted to just stress about how we like to learn together and have fun. So here's some photos from this last summer when we had our five-day meetup. These are our coaches for the Cata Coaching Dojo Live. Uh, you can see a picture of um, Sylvain and Tila. We have launched two books at our summer meetings. We uh, we do training and workshops, and um, we also try to get together and have fun. So here's a couple of photos from our, our beach uh, evening in um, Mukilteo, Washington. So another thing you might know about us is we love our buttons. This is the very first two we ever did, that brain with the heart. Uh, you can still get that button if you ask me. And this one, Plan, Discuss, Complicate, Abandon. Cata, I recently reissued in 2023 with the original correct wording from Hal Froelich, which is Plan, Debate, Complicate, Abandon. If that's your usual PDCA, Cata might just be your answer. So here's a nice picture of all of uh, the people who came this last year. And um, I don't know, I just want to thank, I want to first of all, shout out to our original and, and our core group, which certainly is Mark Rosenthal, Gemma Jones, Jennifer Ayers, Maria Grzenka, uh, and I guess me, and of course, Julie Simmons, who has retired and actually retired to our surprise, and Hal Froelich, who passed away last year. So we're a small group of, of coaches and friends who get together to have fun with Cata School Cascadia. Um, what am I learning? Well, that was what I said. I'd say like, look back, what have I learned over four years? I think one of the things I'm learning is just hang out with the people who want to learn kata. And if you're going to start a kata school, start with the willing and don't do everything yourself. Like ask people to help. I mentioned our YouTube channel. That's Mark's passion. Mark runs the YouTube. Gemma runs the murals. I mostly run the live meetings. Uh, people really want connection and they want community. So make it easy for people to join you and find you. Um, you may have noticed that we try to be inexpensive because we think the cost of an outside coach or the cost of some CATA training might be a barrier. So we try to make it easy. Um, Sylvan pointed out to me that the sheer re relentlessness of the Friday Zooms, we have met on holidays. We have met during holidays so that you know that every single Friday we're going to be there, I think pays off in people understanding that, yeah, we're here and we're going to be here for a while. As a volunteer in the CATA school, I think we get the most out of it. Our friendships have grown, you know, so Im immensely. And um, I've learned so much by uh, talking CATA for an hour every week uh, now, let's see, that's uh, four times, so uh, uh, it's over 200 times. And of course, we are all learning. That is one of our main things. And it's more fun if you learn together. So a lot of people have said to me, well, Cata School Cascadia, you got the A-team. Yes, but we, that's kind of true. We, we are lucky that um, Mike Rother, who's joined us, I think, today, uh, did some of his beta work, his research on the West Coast. So those people in Oregon, they can tell stories from a long time ago. And of course, Hal and, and Mark were some of my teachers, but we don't come up in a hierarchical way. We are all coaches. We are all learners. We are all, you know, we're all learning together. So that's kind of what I've learned. And I guess I'm going to invite people to either answer the question on the mural, what are you learning by getting together with people? Or I think I have only about a minute, right? I think I only have about a minute. So maybe um, not time for live questions, but I okay. Will... Well, while people are, oh, I see Mary's here. That's great. I love seeing the names on the board. And Nicolas from Cata School Francophonie, bienvenue. Um, Mark is actually up next. So it is my honor to introduce you or to introduce, I'm sure you almost all know him, Mark Rosenthal, who's one of certainly one of the um, major and saner voices in the CATA world. We are really um, thrilled to have Mark every Friday, almost every Friday on our Zooms. And I'm sure a lot of people show up just to ask questions from Mark. I used to say in our first year or two, when Mark speaks on the video, you can see everyone pick up their pen. So I, I told I told all the speakers, you know, you could pretty much talk about whatever you want to. And Mark is going to talk about target conditions and striving towards stability. Aren't we all striving towards stability? 
Good morning, everybody. So this is something that's been on the Lean Thinker for quite a while, and actually a lot of people are using various forms of this, but I wanted to go through it with a spin and to think about standards and a hierarchy of standards as target conditions as you work toward stability in your process. And so, you know, when I'm first getting started, often I find that we don't even know what we're trying to get to. And even before we have, this is really what you have to have even before you have a challenge. Do you have a clear standard that you're striving for that defines what a defect-free and an on-time outcome is for your process? What are you striving for and do you, how do you know when you're there? Then, you, then and only then, really, can you even establish a challenge to identify a gap between what you are delivering, when you are delivering, and what you're striving for. So there's always a gap. There's always something between what you're striving for and what you're actually doing. And so until you have this knowledge gap closed, it's really hard to move on. After that, then I'm going to ask, okay, do we know what process, or at least a hypothesis for the process steps that will, if we carry them out, will produce the outcome that we are striving for? So if I do these things in this order, I will produce a defect-free outcome on time. Now, that's a hypothesis to test. But this is where maybe we do some of that small scale testing just to make sure that we even understand what we need to do. Once we have that, now let me back up. So as you can see right away, looking at the process that we're carrying out and analyzing the process before we know whether, how to tell if that process is successful or not is kind of an exercise in futility. So let's establish what we're trying to what we're trying to get as an outcome. Then we can look at what how do we do it. Once we have a working at least a working hypothesis of a process that we believe will produce the outcome, then we've got to ask if we're looking at what the team members are actually encountering. Do they have what they need when they need it, where they need it, as they need it? Are there no interruptions? Are are the tools and materials available? So until you have those clear conditions required for success, you can't expect your team members to be consistently carrying out the process. And it doesn't make sense to do a bunch of 5S work, for example, until you understand the process you're trying to support. And the process you're trying to support doesn't make any sense until you understand what success looks like. Everybody says start with 5S, but the problem with starting with 5S is you end up stabilizing stuff that you don't need or worse, stabilizing without the stuff that you do. And then once I understand and have the conditions for success, then I can ask, and only then, okay, are we actually carrying out the process as it's intended? Because if I don't have the conditions required for success, it is not reasonable to ask about execution. Now, I can use execution to go back and ask, okay, why can't I execute? And I'm probably going to drive back to uh, question three. And if I have everything required and I'm still not succeeding, I'm going to drive back to question two. So this is a kind of a hierarchy to work on. And I can see easily making each of these a target condition as I'm working towards stability. Once I have consistent execution, then I can ask, okay, am I consistently getting the outcome, the results that I hypothesized with number one? So I have to know what I'm trying to do with number one. I have to have a process that I believe will do it. I have to clear all of the barrier, all the barriers, all of the obstacles to actually carrying out the process. And once I'm consistently carrying out the process, I can start looking at whether or not it's actually producing the results that I need. If the answer to that question is yes, then I can ask, okay, Oh, I've got some stability. I'm getting a consistent outcome. Everything's working great. Do I need a different outcome? Do I need different definition of defect-free? Do I need a different definition of on time? 
And then I can come back and say, okay, is there a clear standard for the new outcome that I require, establish the next challenge, and then start marching down the same path? So that's a really quick way to kind of check where am I, where's the ambiguity that I'm dealing with, and ask yourself, you know, what are the obstacles in the way of carrying out this process? So uh, the question I'm really asking for everybody is what experiences have you had when you're trying to improve performance on a process that was wildly inconsistent? Has anybody ever dealt with that? And how have you, how have you dealt with it? Or have you encountered anything where uh, this might help? And with that, I am going to open myself to whatever questions you may have. I have a learner right now who's striving for stability and uh, it can be a challenge. So um, any questions Um, or Gemma, can you see the board and are there any questions on the board? No, I'm looking at it. Okay. Um, If a problem occurs, did the right, has the right escalation process been followed? Yes. And that is kind of part and parcel with all of this. And so at every step I'm at is if a problem occurs, this could be, the way I'm looking at it, this could also be a hierarchy for investigating and for troubleshooting, troubleshooting during an escalation. Do I even know what, what good looks like? Do we even know what the process is? Do we even have the conditions required for success? So if I were to look at my you know, classic and on call story I tell from the Toyota assembly line, you have the team leader asking question three by attempting to perform the standard work precisely as it was designed. Okay, fantastic. And you're absolutely welcome to continue to put questions or comments um, on the appropriate part of the mural board. And we might have time at the end to come back and have some of that. Okay, so uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Altung, who is joining us from Istanbul, from School, Turkey. And I just put in the chat an invitation to let us know where you are from. Um, because I think it is, I know almost everybody here, so I know we've got uh, a pretty wide dispersal of people, but, and nobody's using the chat much, so please go ahead and use the chat, KGG style, where you say things like, thank you, Mark, and that was cool, and I wrote that all down so I can use it tomorrow, because um, that is how we roll. (laughs) Elton, you can go ahead and share your screen. Okay, I will share. And begin your presentation, thank you. Okay, so I prepared these Im- images with the help of AI, by the way. <laughs> so yeah, today, today I will talk about scientific thinking applied to complex situation. Complex situation means uh, open source software development. I applied kata coaching to uh, mentoring open source software development. So, okay, here we go. So a little bit of, about me. I am software engineer and currently working as a software architect. I am co-founder of uh, Kata School Turkey and former Toyota Motor Europe employee. And my use case is about uh, Java user group, by the way. Java is a platform for developing software. Okay, so what is our challenge? Our challenge is, would it be great if developers contributed to op- more to open source world? Because it's very important. Uh, we want to developers to contribute to open source projects because open source development culture gives a maturity to developers. And so we started a program in Java user group, it's a uh, non-profit organization. We started a program and why open source? Open source is very important. So maybe we don't, uh, we use open source a lot in our daily life, like Firefox. Mozilla, like Android, is very important. And about 80% of the business are running on open source software. Okay, the solution. The solution is on, so we ask developers that what prevents them to contribute to open source, and the answer comes from Aristotle. So he said that there are two major things to cause that important factor, one of them is resources. For example, if developers know programming language or do they have computer? Yes, they have, they have resources, they have motivation, but they don't have method, egg of the way is absent. So we just started that program and we just helped them with Kata. Not them, just I 
use kata. Uh, okay, so the next thing, yeah. So it is our PDSA cycle. As a mentor, I provided guidance for two mentees using kata approach. We held 30 minute meetings with each of them, which with the two mentee twice a week. Uh, I total de dedicated two hours per week as a mentor. And I'm the only mentor that I use kata approach. So we started with just PDS, P PDSA cycle because I noticed that the terms like current condition, target condition weren't clear to the mentees at the beginning. And so I, I applied pre-request three approach to mentees to finding the current condition, target condition, and obstacle. So what is pre-request three? So it is from theory of constraint, uh, thinking process. So it's a visual diagram, as you can see, the describing necessary conditions, relationship, and obstacle. You can just map them here. So if you have what should I do first in order to reach my target, the answer is in PRT, pre request three. It is useful because I could show Menti that this is the target condition, this is your current condition. This is very easy to map its condition on this PRT. And this is a snapshot of my mentee's board. As you can see, uh, it is just earlier and later that I found intended objectives. Okay, if they accomplish a work, they just uh, paint it with green. It's like elevator, so I, they can just put a line that this is my target condition, half of the, for example, June, I just want to do that. And the next target condition, the next target condition, so it's very visual mapping, it's a great. Also, the uh, pre request three is one of the advantages is in order to go to a uh, challenge, it would be great if I contributed to open source, yes, but there are three dimensions here. So in order to see the dimensions, it is a great tool. And also I would like to show a snapshot from the board, if I have time. Uh, Yes, you can see the PDCA records. This is our pre request three, and obstacles are in red, as you can see, circles. Green ones are done, Ye yellows are waiting for to do. And we have a life cycle in the process. So, in software, we, have, we said life cycle. You can see the life cycle, but it's to observe the life cycle, you have to make lots of PDC because it's an unknown territory for the mentee uh, because open source world has its own rules. And also we have micro learning area. That's it, thank you. Wow, you 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 did it, five minutes. Good for you, Elton. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> On Monday, we did, uh, uh, well, we, a bunch of uh, five people, no, sorry, four people from KGG did a webinar for Lean Frontiers and three, two or three of the things we talked about were people who can practice kata in their first language and about how challenging it is to learn a new thinking skill in a in your second or third or fourth or whatever language. So I had actually, Gem and I talked about how if it took you a few minutes longer because you're not working in your native language, we would we would be okay with that. So we have some grace for your topic. Um, so thank you very much for sharing the hybrid kata plus, you know, kata in the agile world is kind of new for me. I don't have much um, experience with that, but I am sure there's somebody who wants to offer some comment or question. And I think it's um, not agile, by the way. Sorry, but it's not. A, it's a combination of terror of constraint and kata because agile, I think, is the how can I say? It's a big bubble, but it's empty. So I prefer to say business agility. So agile is very non meaningful mm. thing for me. Okay. And also in the industry, by the way, and because agile, some of them use Scrum, but Scrum is a very low level thing for me. And theory of constraint and Kanban method and Kata is a very good combination to solve the problems. Okay, well, that just shows you how little I know about it. I know Mark knows a bit more about Agile than I do. And I've actually coached somebody who did Agile, but it's not something I have any expertise in. But mentoring, that's a really interesting idea. So is there, Jam, anything on the board that I should be uh, looking at? 
No, we maybe could mention Altug's question and see if anyone's got a response to that. Okay, go ahead and read it. So we've got on the boarding complex systems and situations. How can CATA be applied? How will you establish priorities in your experiments? Right. Okay. Well, yeah, the pre-request three was very helpful for for the mentee because there are lots of steps or intermediate objective or the other name is requires for success. So it is a complex system. It's always moving parts. Mm -hmm. So for the mapping, the priorities and what should she do. So the PRT is very good tool, I think. Okay. Also, I wanted to mention if you have comments and stuff, you can just put them in the chat if you don't want to um, slow us down by speaking live. <laughs> For sure. Okay. Um, I think, Gemma, you're up next. I'm not yeah. even that part of the board. So I, I don't even know how I will introduce Gemma Jones to you. It is one of the great joys of my last few years that I have got to be a coach and a friend and basically family with Gemma Jones. Uh, Gemma has contributed so much to the CATA world uh, through her simplification and, oh, how can I say that, sharing of starter CATA to help really help people who are new have an easier route to using and becoming involved in uh, not only in the improvement CATA, but also just cruising down the scientific thinking highway together. I think uh, Gemma has made unique and valuable contributions, and I'm so thrilled to have be part of Cata School Cascadia with her, but also Cata Girl Geeks. And if you've ever noticed how much crossover there is between Cata Girl Geeks and Cata School Cascadia, uh, that would definitely be me and Gemma and a few other of the women who are kind of involved in Cata School Cascadia. So we share broadly on both sides. Gem, over to you. Please screen share. So I'm so excited to be here. So many friends here. It's wonderful to be celebrating four years. Um, today, I'd like to talk about what I call the coaching cycle bookends and why they are such an important part, if not the most important part of a coaching cycle. And I'm going to share with you some of the things I've been experimenting with and hopefully inspire you to experiment too. So if you're a coach, you'll be familiar with the coaching, the CATA coaching questions, a set of 12 structured questions that the coach asks the learner. You might ask slightly different questions to these, but this is the version I use. But during a coaching cycle, there is also the time right before we start, where we open the coaching cycle, where we welcome the learner, where we say hello. And there's also the part at the end where we close the cycle and where we say goodbye. And both of these times are an opportunity to really connect with the learner, to build and develop a relationship. And also the coach can use that time to gauge the learner's mindset. And this is particularly important at the start of the cycle, but also at the end. But at the start, you can decide how to coach them today. Is my focus on stretching them and focusing hard on their skill development? Or actually today, do they just need more focus on support and reassurance today? So I could actually talk about this subject, this notion of the bookends for hours, but today I wanted to share with you some of the things that I've learned that work for me after experimenting with lots of different things. And I'm not saying you should do all of these things. We all have our own style, but I hope this might give you some ideas. I'm going to focus on the closing part of the cycle first. So at the end of the cycle, I always go straight from the coaching questions into highlighting something specific from the cycle, something really positive that the learner did or said, or something really great on their storyboard. And this gives the learner a dopamine hit right there. I then go in with a question and I make sure I listen really carefully to the answer and I look for or I seek connections and threads. So this might be something like, what does the rest of your day look like? or what are you up to today? Or what are you up to this weekend? And I make sure I keep eye contact and show I'm really interested. And I note down the things that they mention. And then I'll make a comment to look forward to our next session with interest and excitement. I can't wait to see you tomorrow and hear what you learned. Or I'm excited to see what happens with this step. So that learner knows I am with them, supporting them, cheering them on. So that's the end of the coaching cycle. 
Now, if we consider the opening of the cycle, I always, always start by greeting the learner with lots of warmth. I want them to know this is a safe, supportive place, that I'm here for them. And something I've learned that's really important is to make sure I show my hands. And this is a really powerful way to build trust. Our hand gestures show our intentions. And this goes back to our days as cave people. This is deeply embedded in our brains. Now, if I'm in person, I'll keep my hands free and open and show my palms. But most of the time I'm coaching remotely, but this is still super important on Zoom. Just by raising your hands and showing your palms, you can help to communicate that you can be trusted. I'll also try to show my hands during the cycle too and make sure that I maintain eye contact. Again, this is slightly different over Zoom, but I make sure my webcam is lined up really closely with the video feed of the learner. So I'm looking as closely to the camera as possible. Here at the start, I will ask at least two questions. One more general, how was the rest of your day yesterday? Or how is your day going today? And then I'll ask something more specific to them hopefully connected with a detail I found at the last coaching cycle. How did it go with that client visit yesterday? Or how was your meal out with your partner last night? Again, here I am seeking connection and detail. I want to learn as much about the learner as I can. And I guess my point here is, it's not just, hi, how are you? Move on. I'm showing real attention and care. I'm demonstrating that the learner is important. And all the time I am watching and listening carefully, particularly paying attention to their cues and their micro expressions. Now, a bit of a disclaimer here, as with all aspects of coaching, the things I do and the questions I ask are all highly dependent on context and tailored to an individual. I have found these things really work for me in general, but I will still dial it up or down depending on the person in front of me. So I always, always go gently. This is not an inquisition, it's a coaching cycle. I'm not an investigator or a stalker. I see myself as an anthropologist, looking for specific things, details to build that relationship and develop trust and respect. And this must all be done authentically. You cannot fake this stuff, they would know. I genuinely care about my learners. If I didn't, I wouldn't be coaching them. I'm just making sure I get that across to them. So my question to you all is, what could you experiment with in your bookends, the opening and closing of coaching cycles to maximize that time? Thank you. Thank you, Gemma. Oh, that was great. I see uh, some people you have coached are writing into the chat. Um, and as you probably have all noticed, uh, I naturally speak with my hands a lot. So I had that one down. <laughs> That comes from being a, a former teacher, I think. We, we're very much, we're taught to tie all of our words to some kind of physical gesture so people are understanding it. But so like, you'll see me go, the first part, the second part, I do that all the time. And it's not, it's not, I don't even think about it. I can't, I don't know if I could stop. But I think if you find yourself not connecting with your learners at a kind of motivational level, that's really cool. Um, we actually have time to talk about this a little bit. So does anybody want to get off the chat and say something about it? Or have you tried this? Or do you think this would be really hard for you? I would love to hear that stuff. So Sam says in the chat that he recalls me using this approach. I'm excited to hear when we work together, Gemma, it's something I've adopted into my coaching cycle. That's really Sam's cool. come off mute. So Sam, would you like to say something? It's just interesting, the question you, 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 and I know you're very intentional. So I'm curious to know about the question when you said, maximizing the time and knowing you i'm wondering about that um because i see what you shared in terms of connection versus efficiency yeah for me it's about maximizing that time in terms of connection to build the relationship and develop the trust and sometimes that you know um, and i had another slide that i cut out for time but i showed how that opening and closing of the coaching cycle might increase or decrease in time depending on what's going on if the learner shows up and I can see they're distressed or they're anxious or something's going on, then that connection piece, that hello piece might be 15 minutes long or might be 30 minutes long, actually, because we might not ever coach. So it's really about the context with the learner in that moment, but it's all about developing the relationship and the connection. 
And and cool. maybe I'm, it's obvious, but I just say like efficiency of coaching without the learner trusting you is is a waste because like inefficient, right? So you can b- pound through the questions and maybe even get a story, an acceptable storyboard, but maybe there's no learning. And maybe, and it's different too. Like Gemma, like me is usually an outside coach. If it's your manager, um, this is an incredible way to develop a, a better relationship with people. So anybody else want to comment on this? I have, I have a minute or two before I have to call on William to wrap it up for us. So who else? Pam, you, you are off mute, I think. Well, I just want to say, I wish I had learned this as a coach earlier um, in my Kata journey, but thank goodness my learners love, you know, are gracious and, um, they still learn despite my being a stalker and an investigator. (laughs) (laughs) Awesome. That's fantastic. Love it. Okay. There's lots and lots of um, questions, comments, including Mark reminding us all that there's no way to better way to shut down learning than to bring fear into the experience. That's great. Okay. So William Harvey, Dr. William Harvey Uh, Joining us from Cincinnati, Ohio, sorry, I forgot where you lived before. Um, I'm going to turn it over to you for our fifth and final presentation of the day. You have, well, you have a little bit more than 10 minutes, William, so go crazy. Thank you so much for volunteering to present. Absolutely, my pleasure. Welcome, everybody. Happy to be back on Cotta School Cascadia this year and talking a little bit about what I've observed over this last year from Cotta School Cascadia. And I'm going to talk in terms of framing and reframing, but I want to go back to the original book that Mike published because that isn't what we talk about a lot on Cotta School Cascadia. We talk about the practice guide most often and occasionally reference the orange book. But if you go back to the original book, you know, Mike talked about his reason for investigating Toyota and stared that we have been trying to copy the wrong things. Critical aspects of Toyota are not visible. And then if we were trying to reverse engineer something, we'll get into an implementation mode. Which brings me to Kata School Cascadia. Whether it's the learner, I should say primarily the learner calls when I get to join most, but I'll often hear people talk about a storyboard as if that's the delivery. And it revolves around that conversation so much. And one of the really challenging things I hear about how people are framing scientific thinking and Toyota Kata coaching is they'll say something along the lines of, I only get a coach once a week. I only get a coach every other month. And I'm like, well, that really isn't true how I've experienced it. So I'm gonna share just a a chance to reframe it through some of the experiences that I've heard. And I think they apply well to manufacturing as well as administration and healthcare, just the same. But when I think about it in terms of the times I get a coach, I'll say I have dozens of opportunities a day to use Toyota Kata scientific thinking to coach people, which differs a lot from when I hear people say there's only one opportunity. And I think it's because we're anchored to that storyboard. So if I had a subtitle today, it would be the storyboard is optional. I valued the storyboard, I shared the storyboard, and I use the tools that are there as the learner needs them. But what I'm finding is if I only limit it to the storyboard, my chances go down quite a few opportunities each day. So I'm gonna go back to the original Toyota Kata book and really talk about where Mike was talking about experimentation and hypotheses. And I'll, I'll share a plug to Gemma because Gemma put together one of the sheets that I've seen on her website that talks about, is it refutable? Is it testable? And that really is where Mike is also talking about hypothesis. So where in the world do you get a practice Toyota Kata coaching and everyday experiences? And where I'm seeing it coming is in the real conversations we have every day. They're in meetings we attend. They're in conversations where we're doing some type of root cause investigation about a defect or incident that we didn't want to occur the way it did. And when I think about the hypothesis that Mike talked about, he mentioned a lot about how valuable it was when you learned something different. And to me, that was one of those things that I didn't realize I was digging into so often, but it's really how do you get to a point where you could test the idea, let go of the opinion, let go of the judgment, and not say, is it good or bad, but rather, how do we go test the idea? And when I hear these conversations, I think some of them are going to ring true. If you've ever worked in a cost accounting world and you're a lean practitioner, you would probably hear your, uh, let's say, probably hear the alarm bells going off when you hear the cost accountant say, it's less expensive if we produce at higher volumes. Like that may be true if we were to sell this stuff, but oftentimes I have a process that I'm trying to perfect, which is throwing away old inventory. So I'm like, why in the world is that my work? So there's something wrong with that assumption at the beginning, which allows me to really test a hypothesis of like, is that actually true? 
So I'd say that's one example of an area where we talk about costing models where Toyota Kata can come into play. I don't need them to be a learner, a coach, mm -hmm. or a second coach. I just need to apply scientific thinking to that idea, create a hypothesis with the learner and go test it, really using that experimenting record as my backdrop to, let's say, my favorite tool out of the, you know, out of the standard toolkit. I didn't know Mike was going to be on the day, but I, I put this one next, right? When I think about authority, you know, I know Mike, he shared it will not work. So we don't really need to do anything else because he's the best Toyota Kata practitioner ever. Well, very quickly, we'll dismiss that and say, yeah, Jen is the expert, Mark's the expert. I was like, well, they may be, but how do you test that idea? So how do we get back into the workplace and try whatever it is we're trying? Then I see some things happen like this where I'll say, well, we haven't had that defect happen recently. It's probably not going to happen again anytime soon. So we really, really don't need to do anymore. But when I hear that, it's like, well, that's not necessarily true. There's nothing that leads me to believe that the preventive actions are in place. There's no systemic fix. So they can start digging in a little bit more with that person to say, let's investigate that further because there is a hypothesis test. And quite often the other way where you might've had a rash of bad weeks, maybe bad months. And you just start to say, we must be due for a break because it's just been so bad recently. Well, that in itself is another bias that shows up and a really good opportunity as a coach to say, well, why is that true? How would you know that we're doing the right work in order not to have that issue in the future? And in my mind, I hear this again, dozens of times a day. And then the one that I learned this past year was the idea of an independent double check. Now, from my Six Sigma and Lean training, I knew I shouldn't do double checks because they weren't very effective. But I really never questioned how ineffective they were. And what I found surprised me. From healthcare, we find that independent double checks will actually reduce the quality effectiveness of your system. So the very thing that we think is helping us actually hurts us through a process called social loafing. And I have a bunch of very specific ideas that you know work in my workplace or that are present in my workplace that show up every day. But what I find most often is that experimenting record is the one I can fall back to quickly without actually having any issue. So I, I really leave with this idea of storyboards are optional. And while I certainly say they are valuable and I'm not discrediting them all, if I limit my thinking that I need a storyboard to Toyota Kata coaching, I'm going to limit my opportunity as the coach. So I really look at it as saying, if you think that is the requirement or the outcome you're after, it's going to limit how many times you can practice. And I go back to really what Mike was sharing. Is there a hypothesis? Is it testable? And I bring in some of the basics of Kaizen, which is really how do you do rapid experimentation to learn as quickly as you can? And then associating or disassociating judgment of good or bad with that test. The experiment is just what it is, not good or bad. And I think breaking that paradigm, particularly in the Western cultures, is more challenging, but it does allow me to have a bunch of those repetitions. And back to where I heard about learner safety, that's really what I'm driving in when I say, I'll take the burden, let's go do the test. If it fails, that's on me. And as that coach or the manager coach in that moment, it becomes a huge opportunity for me. And then when I think about the, the lessons Mike taught, I would just say they're really valuable to go back to now after eight years in the Kata practice as a coach and a second coach and a learner, of course, and say, well, what did I miss that first time? So I'd encourage you, while the practice guide is awesome and the Orange Book is really helpful and some of the other work that's come out recently is very beneficial, go back to that original book because I think some of the foundations to the work are in there. And the expansion of that is really just saying, here's how different people are applying it. But certainly think about the opportunities you can apply Toyota Kata coaching on a day in and day out basis. So that leads me to my question. In addition to the storyboard, where else have you practiced Toyota Kata coaching? Okay, well, thank you, William. And I'm going to let people go to the storyboard or the chat to respond to that. I, it has struck me, though, um, as we maybe as we get more mature coaches or people with more experience, this has become a, a bigger topic um, in the Kata Coaching Dojo Masterclass or among the, the alumni of the Masterclass. We've been working on Kata in meetings. Like if you're sitting in a meeting, <laughs> uh, what question could you ask or when is it appropriate to use those questions? And so we're working on a, a version of the dojo that's all around. We call it Kata in the wild. But um, I think this is something that as it's as a coach, of course, the storyboard helps you with an, with a learner, but also you don't need the storyboard in front of you to ask the coaching questions. I would just caution people to not think that the storyboard is optional for the learner, especially the new learner, right? So you are speaking for, about coaches. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Um, let's have a look at what's on the board. Uh, do you see answers to your question that you'd like to comment on? The artifacts are not the same as the thinking. Gosh, Hal used to call the storyboard the artifact all the time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Tracy, I, I want to comment on Sam's because I love it. 
as a, as a parent, as his comment in the chat. Okay, go That's ahead. That's where I, I had shared with a, a new learner and who eventually became a coach. Without getting into too much knowledge creation and where I believe it starts is how do you develop a student's, or not a student, but a, a child's thinking? And they're putting the world together the way that makes sense to them, as do all of us. But as a parent, I find that Toyota Kata coaching is incredibly helpful. Mm -hmm. Letting them explore the world to figure out what does and doesn't work. Obviously, keeping them safe when I need to. But at the same time, just saying, well, the, the outcome may be bad, but it's a valuable lesson learned. And, you know, one case in point, my daughter wanted to, you know, she spent six months working on something for a, a church program, decided she wanted to stop and go hang out with her friend for the night instead. I let her do it. And then she came back with that realization of, hey, I made the wrong decision, right? I put six months into this and I didn't get the benefit I wanted. So in those moments, I'd say it's a great opportunity. And with my four at home, there's at least one opportunity a day to, to get into that kind of conversation. So I love that you brought that up, Sam. It's a very valuable place to practice quite a bit every day. Um, I find it's great with coworkers and even other family members who aren't your kids because it stops you from giving advice or, you know what I mean? It stops you. So if you just did what Gemma said and connected a little bit and then let that coaching cycle go, um, I think that's a really great strategy for all kinds of things. People feel really respected, I think, when you do that. Instead of saying, what were you thinking? You could say, what, what did you expect to happen and what did you learn? Anyway, yeah, I find that super helpful. Okay, well, we have time for some questions, wrap up, socializing, anything people want to say or add. I would love to hear from people about maybe your experience with your CATA school or what connecting has meant to you. There's lots of people here. I'm open now to comments, questions, follow up, um, contributions. Let's go. Just unmute or, or put your hand up. Philip, you unmuted. Did you have something to say? Well, um, uh, uh... A part that I'm really glad to um, uh, be part of uh, Friday calls. A lot of time, it's the the most fun part of my weeks. Me too. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, uh, prior to starting the coaches' Zooms, I would occasionally call Julie Simmons or Mark Rosenthal with some sort of crazy, uh, you got to talk to somebody about this stuff. But since we started the Friday Zooms, um, the wider, sh I think I can say without hesitation, I think even Mark would say, uh, we all got better because we were talking more and hearing different perspectives and, you know, things like that. So it's, uh, find your, you don't have to join our Zoom, but find your community or at least get a buddy that you can talk to. We have a lot of people come to the Friday Zoom because they're all by themselves or uh, some people kind of slink in and say, you know, haven't coached in a long time, but I'd like to come back. I think that happened with you, Philip. And, you know, we are pleased to see you at any, you are welcome. In fact, I think the open, Gemma put the um, the first line of our webpage on the board. And it says something like, if you are looking for the CATA community, welcome home, because we want people to feel that kind of welcome when they come. Christophe is in France. He joins us every honestly every friday i think even christmas eve at like uh, 9 p.m or something for him all the way from france uh because he didn't have very many people around him who were practicing kata anybody else want to just say something um i'm looking at you kelly because you look like you wanted to say something i know you've started your own school nurcell i haven't seen you in a year it's fantastic to see you from turkey now that i've been called out yes um, I apologize, I was late, but this is just like Kata School Cascadia and the KGG were an inspiration for me to start a Kata School just to create more community and more space like this, um, which is, this is just lovely. And it's wonderful that we can make spaces like this and we don't have to be together to do it. Thank you, Kelly. And Kelly's first Kata project as a learner with us, I'm sure she was already practicing at work, but it was a learner, it was around her family. And I don't know if your family knows that you cater them all the time, but uh, my family certainly knows. So yeah, cool. Okay, yes, well, we, we have five, five minutes left uh, in the um, Zoom. I, I have the Zoom officially booked till quarter after because we like to hang out, but I'm going to stop the recording at the top of the hour so people can just hang out together and talk. I never met anybody who wasn't happy to have five minutes at the top of a meeting left. So I am going to stop the recording in just a minute, but I'm going to ask... Um, Mark, Gemma, William, or Altung, if you have some closing comments, let's get them on the recording. Maybe I just to, yeah, go. I just want to direct people to the mural. There's some links down at the bottom um, at the 
bottom underneath the, the questions and the content from today, um, various things, including our resource mural um, and also three new brilliant, more recent Cata books what? that are out. Yes, from yes. Some of the Gemma, the why don't you, um, whatever you call it, you're queen of the mural. Can you gather everyone, so, like make them follow you down there? So I can summon everybody summon. and I can show you down. So this is where we've got links to the books. They're the, I will apologize, they're links to the American um, Amazon. So obviously you can get them from somewhere that's more convenient to you and where you are. Um, but there's those three links. There's also links to the Cata School website. And um, there's a information here if you want to join our Friday Zooms and you don't currently do that. And um, there's also, we've mentioned the KGG, the Cata Girl Geeks, if you are female or know a female, um, who you would like to recommend to the group. There's an email address at the bottom. Um, and there's also some space over on the right for any other general comments or things you'd like to say. Thank you, Jem. And thanks for building that board for us. Um, Mark, anything you'd like to say as we close out? Um, I'd just like to kind of tag on to what William was saying because I think it's crucially important, especially if there's an existing structure for talking about improvement in an organization, to inject scientific thinking or better scientific thinking into their existing structure, I find is a lot easier than to rip it out and replace it. And so that's something that I'm very conscious of is what's their current condition? What are they already doing that is close enough that we can just nudge in the right direction? That might be easier for an insider than an outsider, but you are the one who taught me to ask Six Sigma people, not about obstacles, but sources of variation. So thank you for that. Uh, Mike, did you want to say something? I think you leaned in. I just leaned in by your yeah. perception. It's amazing. I just want to say congratulations on four years of community building. Nice job. Thank <clears> you. <throat> I bought myself some balloons. Yeah, very, <laughs> very appropriate. Okay, well, thanks very much. And thank you, Mike. We always, Mark thanks you formally all the time, but we thank you very much for putting the Toyota Cata framework out in the world and helping us all change the world for the better. I've been Tracy Defoe, your host for this fourth year meetup for Cata School Cascadia. Have a great week, and I hope we see you again on Zoom soon. It's so great being a Yeti. It makes me want to yell.